One of the most common things that you'll come across in taking care of patients in the ICU is the management of their airway for different reasons. We have many tools at our disposal to try and assist our patients breathing, but sometimes we need to take control and manage their airway and breathing for them through intubation, which I'll discuss now. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. As always, the notes for this lesson as well as all the previous videos are available exclusively to the YouTube and Patreon members. You can find links to join both of those down in the lesson description below. Also, don't forget to head over to icuadvantage.com or follow that link down in the lesson description to take a quiz on this lesson, test your knowledge while also being entered into a weekly gift card, as well as don't forget that you can help support this channel through the purchase of an ICU Advantage sticker. Uh, again, those are found at the website icuadvantage.com forward slash support link down in the description. All right, so in this lesson, I'm going to talk about the basics of what intubation is, why it is that we use it, and really some of the risks that can come about with its use. So let's start things off talking about what is intubation. So when it comes to airway management and subsequent advanced airway placement, we really have several options available to us. The most common that we're going to see is our endotracheal intubation, but this does also include things like the tracheostomy tubes, which I did discuss in that previous lesson. So intubation or endotracheal intubation really consists of the insertion of a flexible tube, aka the endotracheal tube, through the patient's vocal cords and into their trachea. Now, this tube can be inserted either through their mouth, so this is our orotracheal, or through the nose, which would be our nasotracheal. Having this tube in place really allows us to control the patient's airway, ensuring they have a good open airway and allowing us to control their ventilation and oxygenation. So the primary way of us doing this is going to be through the use of a ventilator, but we can also achieve this using a bag valve mask as well. So having an endotracheal tube in place gives us much better control over the volume of breaths, so our ventilation, the frequency of those breaths, as well as the percentage of oxygen that we're delivering to them. Also, having this tube in place fully secures the patient's airway and protects it from aspiration. So make sure and watch the previous lesson on endotracheal tubes if you haven't already as I discuss some of this stuff over there. Now, this is an invasive and uncomfortable thing for our patient, and while it's often needed, it does come with some of its own risks, which I'll talk about in just a bit here. All right, so why do we intubate people? So let's talk about some of the indications for that. There are actually a lot of different reasons why we would need to do so, but it really boils down to helping patients protect their airway, ventilating, or oxygenating. The underlying reasons for needing this help could be the result of whatever disease process they have going on, or it could be the result of some medical procedure or surgery that really prevents the patient from doing so, particularly with their airway protection and ventilation. So let's talk about some of the common reasons why we would intubate someone. So first and foremost is going to be respiratory failure. So this can either be hypercapnic, hypoxic, or a combination of the two. And so here we may need to take over their breathing to ensure proper ventilation for that CO2 clearance to assist them in their respiratory effort, or they may be requiring high levels of oxygen to battle hypoxia. Now, sometimes we are able to try non-invasive means of support first, but other times things are happening pretty quickly and we really need to quickly jump into intubating the patient right away. Having an ET tube in place does also give us better control over things like PEEP as well as access to more advanced ventilator modes that we can help to better optimize oxygenation for our patient. Uh, example, this would be something like APRV. Now another indication is going to be our decreased mental status or our altered mental status. So here a decreased mental status can really prevent our patients from protecting their own airway and interfere with their proper breathing. So typically if their GCS is less than or equal to 8, then we intubate. Kind of a catchy phrase to help us remember it. This can also apply though to rapidly deteriorating mental status, especially if it's combined with respiratory compromise. So this is something that's common in patients with brain injury, strokes, and overdoses. 
another indication is going to be for a medical procedure. And this is a pretty common case here and applies to medical procedures requiring sedation as well as surgery and the use of anesthesia. These medications can impact both their level of consciousness and their ability to protect their own airway as well as impacting the patient's ability to breathe on their own. Some procedures we can sedate the patient without actually needing to intubate them, but especially in cases of EGDs and TEEs that we're often going to intubate prior so we can properly sedate them as well as protect their airway during the procedure. And then there are some procedures like bronchoscopy which are going to require an ET tube being in place in order to perform it. Another indication is going to be our airway issues. So if the patient has some sort of injury or impending issue such as swelling or edema that's at imminent risk of compromising their airway, we will intubate to protect that airway and keep it open. So this can also include cases of trauma which impact the patient's face, neck, and chest. Another indication is going to be for aspiration. So sometimes the patient airway will be at risk from aspiration, either from issues preventing them from clearing their own airway or in cases of significant bleeding, such as trauma, esophageal varices, epistaxis, etc. And then finally, the last major indication I'm going to talk about is going to be apnea. So if our patients just aren't breathing, then we need to intervene and take over that for them. And so this could be the result of something like a drug overdose or a brain injury. All right, so now let's talk about some of our contraindications for intubation. And first, while this isn't necessarily a true contraindication in the normal sense, a big reason not to intubate is if it's against your patient's wishes. Make sure you know their code and intubation status, as sometimes they may be deteriorating and not able to respond, so knowing their code status is definitely something important for you to know. That said, in some of these moments, obviously the next of kin or the healthcare power of attorney at this point is going to be able to make those decisions for them, and they certainly can reverse course on what the patient had previously stated if the patient's unable to speak for themselves. So that said, the real big and obvious contraindication is going to be if there is some sort of obstruction or injury that's going to prevent safely passing a tube into the trachea. So this could be the result of trauma to the orofacial area or a foreign body that prevents safely intubating. Acute cervical spine fractures may also make this challenging, but with a skilled practitioner, it is still possible to intubate without actually manipulating the neck in a way that could cause more damage. That said, if we do have one of these situations in which we can't safely pass a tube into the trachea, and they do have a need for the airway to be secured, then a surgical airway such as a trach or a crike may be necessary at this point. So while intubation is definitely considered to be our best airway management method that we have available to us, there are potential complications that can come from its use. Now this technique really requires a good deal of clinical experience to truly master. And even then, with a skilled successful intubation, complications can still arise. The first and most obvious complication is going to be from a failed intubation. So this is where the practitioner is unable to successfully place that endotracheal tube into their airway. And this can be the result of many different things such as the patient's anatomy, if there's edema, obstruction, trauma, bleeding, secretions, if the patient is actively vomiting, also the patient's lack of reserve needing a quick and successful attempt, as well as even just the practitioner's skill, they can all potentially have an effect on whether or not this is a successful intubation or not. Sometimes it can be difficult to view the airway properly or to actually advance that endotracheal tube past those vocal cords, so this can lead to aborting the attempt and returning back to our bag valve masking of the patient. Even worse, though sometimes the endotracheal tube can end up in the patient's esophagus, and it's important to know that this is a medical emergency when this happens. So in these cases, our patients are not going to be ventilated and oxygenated immediately like in other aborted attempts. So I'm going to discuss this more in the next lesson, but in these cases, it needs to be immediately removed and then intubation needs to be reattempted. Now, the big concern with our failed intubation, though, is going to be that while we do pre-oxygenate the patient, usually before uh, attempting the intubation, during the attempt, we're not able to ventilate them and deliver oxygen. Thus, this can lead to hypercapnia and potentially life-threatening hypoxia and cardiac arrest. So this can make emergent intubations with patients who are already compromised, and especially those who don't have much reserve, extremely stressful and intense situations. 
Now, another big concern during intubation is actually pulmonary aspiration. So until that endotracheal tube is in place and that cuff is inflated, there's gonna be a risk of aspiration into the lung. Now, our common culprits here are gonna be secretions, blood, and probably the biggest is gonna be stomach contents and emesis. So this can ultimately lead to pneumonia, worsening respiratory failure for the patient, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now we do have techniques such as rapid sequence intubation, which I'll discuss in a future lesson to really help to minimize these risks, but they certainly do happen. Now, other complications can come about during the intubation itself, such as the laryngospasm, bleeding, perforation of the trachea or esophagus, fractured or dislodged teeth, which can then become aspirated, C-spine fractures, damage to cartilage of the jaw, or vocal cord damage and paralysis. Now, in addition to those complications of the intubation itself, as discussed in the previous endotracheal tube lesson, our biggest concern is going to be infection and pneumonia. So the endotracheal tube provides a pathway for organisms to get into the lungs, and ventilator-acquired pneumonia or VAP is a big concern for our intubated patients. So this can lead to additional complications, longer intubation times, longer ICU and hospital stays, as well as increased morbidity and mortality. And you can think about this, that by having this endotracheal tube in place, we're really bypassing the normal respiratory defenses for preventing infection by having this tube in place there. Now, also, as mentioned in the last lesson, we do have the risk of injury from the cuff itself if it's overly inflated, or even potentially if the patient is intubated for an extended period of time. Extended periods of intubation can also lead to tracheal stenosis, erosion, and necrosis. Now, being intubated also reduces the patient's cough effectiveness and their ability to properly clear secretions, which it is important for us to be able to clear those for them, especially when it comes to keeping that tube patent. And then also, last but not least, this is just an uncomfortable thing for patients. I mean, if you think about it, you have got this tube that's the size of your pinky or your ring finger that's going back in through the back of your mouth down into your windpipe. I don't know about you guys, but I've got a pretty decent gag reflex, so having that in place definitely sounds like something that would be uncomfortable for me. Oftentimes, we need to have the patient sedated in order to tolerate this tube, as well as get their compliance with the ventilator, but that also has its own potential consequences, including delirium. As well as at some point, they do need to be awake in order to participate in our breathing trials and work to get them liberated or extubated. This can be very uncomfortable and really potentially traumatizing for the patient, so it's important to kind of understand that perspective. Now, with all of this stuff mentioned, really know that some complications can be acute in nature and others can have potentially long-term consequences as well as the potential for those fatal mistakes. Therefore, it is really important that you are prepared, have knowledge and experience in this process to help avoid any potential mistakes as well as to catch any issues that may come up along the way. In fact, in the next lesson, I'm going to be talking more about the process of intubation itself, as well as our part in that process. So hopefully this lesson has given you a basic understanding of what intubation is, some of those reasons on why we use it, and some of the concerns that we're looking out for with its use in place. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.